He wanted a first-rate observing site, undisturbed by clouds or city lights, and marked by good seeing. Seeing is the astronomer's term for a steady atmosphere through which the shimmering of an astronomical image in the telescope is minimized. Lowell built his observatory far away from home on Mars Hill here in Flagstaff, Arizona. Lowell sketched the surface features of Mars and particularly the canals, which mesmerized him. Now, observations of this sort aren't easy. You put in long hours at the telescope in the chill of the early morning. Most of the time, the seeing is crummy. When the seeing is bad, the image of Mars blurs and distorts, and you have to ignore what you've observed. But occasionally, the image steadies, and the features of the planet marvelously flash out at you. You must then remember what you've seen and accurately commit it to paper. You must put your preconceptions aside and with an open mind set down the wonders that Mars holds in store for us. This is Percival Lowell's own notebook. Here's what he thought he saw. Bright and dark areas, a hint of a polar cap, and canals. Lots and lots of canals. Lowell believed that he was seeing a globe-girdling network of great irrigation canals carrying water from the melting polar caps to the thirsty inhabitants of the equatorial cities. He believed the planet was inhabited by an older and wiser race, perhaps very different from us. He believed that the seasonal changes in the dark areas were due to the growth and decay of vegetation. He believed that the planet was Earth-like. All in all, he believed too much. Lowell's Martians were a dying race. Their once great cities had fallen into ruins. Lowell believed that the Martian climate was changing, that the precious water was trickling away into space, that the planet was becoming a desert world. The canals, he thought, were a last desperate measure, a heroic engineering effort to conserve the scarce water. But their technology, although far more advanced than ours, was inadequate to stem a planetary catastrophe. The most serious contemporary challenge to Lowell's ideas came from an unlikely source, the biologist Alfred Russell Wallace, co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection. Wallace correctly showed that the air on Mars was much too cold and thin to permit the existence of liquid water. He wrote that only a race of madmen would build canals under such conditions. Lowell's Martians were benign and hopeful, even a little godlike. Very different from the malevolent menace posed by H.G. Wells and Orson Welles in The War of the Worlds. Both sets of ideas passed into the public imagination through 
Sunday supplements and science fiction and excited generations of eight-year-olds into fantasizing that they themselves might one day voyage to the distant planet Mars. I remember reading with breathless fascination the Mars novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs. I journeyed with John Carter, gentleman adventurer from Virginia, to Barsoom, as Mars was known by its inhabitants. Wandering among the beasts of burden called Thotes, winning the hand of the lovely Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium, and befriending a 10-foot high green fighting man named Tars Tarkas as the moons of Mars hurtled overhead on a summer's evening on Barsoom. aroused generations of eight-year-olds, myself among them, to consider the exploration of the planets as a real possibility, to wonder whether we ourselves might one day venture to the distant planet Mars. John Carter got to Barsoom by standing in an open field, spreading his hands and wishing hard at Mars. I can remember spending many an hour in my boyhood arms resolutely outstretched in an open field in twilight, imploring what I believed to be Mars to transport me there. It never worked. There had to be some better way. And there was. The real road to Mars was opened by a boy who loved skyrockets. <laughs> 